Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm very happy that we've had people joining in on this uh, topic, which is really uh, a new one for us in the IVS. Although I do think that most everyone here collects and processes data. And given that, we really appreciate that a lot of new technologies which have come to the forefront have accelerated this field in ways that we probably didn't dream about previously. And those are exactly the things that Yonina is working on. Uh, Yonina is the Dorothy and Patrick Gorman Professor of Math at the Weizmann Institute since 2019. She's head of the Signal Acquisition Model Processing and Learning Lab. You pay attention to those uh, uh, words. The acronym is SAMPL, S-A-M-P-L. She also heads the Manya Eagle Center for Biomedical Engineering and Signal Processing at the Weizmann. Uh, previously, Yonina was a professor of electrical engineering at the Technion. And in addition, she holds adjunct or advisory or visiting positions at several institutions, including MIT Stanford, Duke, and Fudan University in Shanghai. Uh, Yonina has won many awards, uh, including being noted as a highly cited researcher by the Web of Science, a member of the Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities, and a fellow of the European Association for Signal Processing. Uh, she was selected both as one of the 50 distinguished women scientists in Asia and one of the 50 most influential women in Israel. Uh, her research has enabled tweaking more information out of incomplete or reduced data sets, reducing power consumption and costs, and re uh, reduce medical diagnostic errors. Uh, she's applied this to medical imaging, radar, communications, and optical and other scientific imaging. Um, before we start, I would just like to say that uh, Yonina has kindly agreed to uh, host questions during the course of the talk. Uh, you have the capability to unmute yourself. By default, you're muted. Uh, you can unmute yourself, ask the question, but then please do uh, mute yourself again after that. Um, so with no further ado, I think uh, we would like to start. I'd just like to remind everyone that the IVS does have these monthly webinars on various topics, which uh, we find of high interest to our members. Uh, all of these are recorded and they're saved and archived on the IVS website, so you can review them at any time in the future. So please, Yanina, we're looking forward to it. Thank you so much. So really, thank you so much for that super, super kind um, introduction. And really, it's, it's an honor and privilege to have this opportunity. I'd like to thank the organizers for um, inviting me. I know my topics are not, you know, totally aligned properly with the norm in this webinar. So I'm, I'm really happy for the opportunity and, you know, hope that uh, people find this relevant. Uh, in particular, I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Cohen and, and Professor Barak for the invitation. And do feel free to ask questions as we're going through. Um, again, I'm really, really happy if there's questions and very happy uh, if this can initiate any collaboration. So if you find anything interesting, then feel free either to ask questions at the end or during the talk, or of course to contact me uh, offline. So what I wanna share with you today are some ideas that we, and of course many, many others in our field have been working on, on how we could try and couple physics and algorithms together in order to try and overcome some of the bounds that we have today that limit uh, today's technology. So what we're gonna try to show today that these ideas could pave the way to technology that could be faster, smaller, uh, more portable, consume less power, and have higher resolution than existing devices for signal acquisition. And this could have applications in many domains, ranging from domains that are maybe more electrical engineering oriented, like communications and radar, but also other scientific domains like uh, optical imaging, medical imaging, and uh, biological inference. So, you know, as everyone knows today, we live in a digital world where more and more of the data is being acquired digitally. And of course, what that means is that we have to take the true physical signals that we have around us, like for example, this music coming out of the guitar and convert it to a series of bits, which are then processed on the computer. And of course the advantage is that once we have bits, we could apply sophisticated algorithms to these bits in order to infer whatever the information is that we wanna gain out of the acquired signal. So this is part of the field of signal processing, which is really my main uh, uh, field of, of interest. And signal processing is really kind of the science behind all of the digital devices that we have today, which affect you know, almost every aspect of, of modern lives, whether it's medical imaging, hearing aids, of course, dating back to the radio 50 years ago, wearable devices, uh, autonomous vehicles, speech recognition, and many, many more applications. 
So this is a cool song by a pop singer, Judy Gorman. If you haven't heard it, you should go ahead and look at the words because they're kind of funny. But anyway, she sings about being an analog girl in a digital world, which very much fits uh, what we do in the lab. So, you know, true signals around us, physical signals are, of, of course, analog, right? They're continuous in time. But we're in a digital world where we want to be able to process them by sophisticated computers, and therefore we have to convert them to bits. And this is done today by a hardware device called an analog to digital converter, an ADC, which what the ADC does is it takes this signal that we see here in time, it first samples it in time, so it looks at particular points in time, and then converts these samples into bits so that we could represent it on the computer. And the, the theory that dictates how the sampling and how the bit conversion is done are the well-known theorems by Shannon and Nyquist, which date back you know, almost 100 years ago. So let me try to give some intuition to the Shannon Nyquist theorems. Of course, we won't go into the math, but just give some intuition into what they, what they say. So the, the problem is that we have some physical signal and we're going to be representing it digitally. So what we're gonna see are only these blue points, okay? So what we're left with are only the dots. We don't know what the true underlying signal was. Now, of course, the original signal fits the data. So if we're only given the blue points, we could always you know, trace the original signal. But the problem is that there's many other signals that will also fit those same points. So you see two of them here on this slide, all of these, uh, all, the, all of these continuous signals fit the points equally well, so we can't really know what our true original signal was. And if we don't know the original signal, then we may be losing information. So intuitively, you can see that just from what I drew here on this slide, the other signals that I drew are changing much more rapidly than the original uh, true continuous time signal. So one way to ensure that we have a unique recovery is to limit the speed of change, meaning that we're gonna assume in advance that the true signal doesn't change too much with respect to the underlying sampling rate. And this is really the idea behind the, the most famous sampling theorem, which is the Nyquist theorem. And what the Nyquist theorem says is that we have to sample at least at a rate that is twice the maximal frequency of the signal. Okay, so that is kind of captured by the intuition that the signal can't vary too much with respect to the sampling rate. So this gives us a limit on the actual sampling rate. We also have limits on the bit rate, right? After we sample, we have to take the amplitudes and convert them to bits, to binary. And this is dictated by the Shannon theory. So Shannon's theorems also give us uh, bounds on the amount of information in bits that we could send over a given communication channel. And they also give us bounds on the minimal number of bits that we need in order to represent a given signal with minimal distortion. So I won't go into the details of these theorems, but basically, if we summarize them, we have both rates on how fast we have to sample and also limits on how many bits we need in order to get a good description of the signal without too much distortion and in order for us to be able to communicate it over a given channel with a given bandwidth. So in principle, it looks like the problems have been solved many, many years ago, right? We can now convert to digital and do our processing in digital. So what is the problem? The, the problem is that today in modern applications, we of course want to use more and more bandwidth, right? We want to communicate more information. We want to get better resolution. So bandwidth, of course, dictates resolution in, in different imaging problems. And once we increase the bandwidth, that means from the Shannon Nyquist theorems that we have to increase both the sampling rates and the bit rates. And this is very difficult to do from a technology point of view. So actually implementing high rate samplers is something that is quite difficult. It consumes a lot of power. Also, once we sample at a high rate, we have you know, terabytes of bits that we have to save, we have to transmit. Um, so we also have a problem on the digital side. And in different applications, the trade-offs are not just in terms of hardware. So for example, in medical imaging, the Nyquist rate actually is the reason why MRI scanning takes so long. In CT, it's the reason why we have so much radiation. Um, so there's other trade-offs. They're not just hardware trade-offs, but different trade-offs in terms of medical imaging resolution and more. So at the end, this ADC, right, which we, at least as digital signal processors, we always just take for granted, right, somehow we convert our information into digital, but this is actually a bottleneck in many modern applications. Another aspect that looks like it's not related to sampling, but actually, actually it's two sides of the same coin, um, is our physical bounds. For example, bounds on resolution. So we know that all measuring devices, any physical measuring device is going to be bandwidth limited so that we can't see with infinite precision 
in space, time, or in frequency. And this is because of diffraction, right? So waves, when they're propagating, they're going to spread as they pass through an aperture. So for example, uh, in optical imaging, we have the well-known Abyss diffraction limit, which says that we can see details that are smaller than half the wavelength that we use for illumination. So if we're using an optical imaging device, then you know, we'll be able to see, for example, cells and bacteria, but we won't be able to see proteins and small molecules with just the standard optical device. Um, other trade-offs are, for example, in radar and communication, or even in medical devices like an ultrasound probe, we know that the spatial resolution is proportional to the array size when we have multiple antennas. And these are all physical bounds, right? They have nothing to do with our particular hardware. They're kind of, you know, we regard them as kind of absolute physical bounds that uh, we can't get around. So we see that if we combine, you know, the bounds that are coming from the physics or the science and the bounds that are coming from the math, Altogether, these put pretty strong limitations on technologies today. And this is really what we want to try and overcome. So the way we propose to do that, and this slide is rather abstract, so hopefully I'll make it more clear as I go through the talk, is that instead of trying to overcome them by science alone or math alone, to really try and combine the two. So what we're going to see is that we can use physics to inspire interesting new ways of conveying information, even though that information can't be readily extracted. But then we can use the math to extract this information. And by combining them, we could transmit information in ways that people didn't think of transmitting before. But together with the math, we will be able to extract the information. And in this way, we'll be able to overcome some of the existing limitations that we alluded to before. So let me try to make that a little bit more concrete by giving kind of two uh, applications. And then, of course, we'll go more into the detail uh, later on in the talk. So the first application I want to mention is ultrasound. So ultrasound imaging is, is of course, wave-based. It's based on uh, ultrasound waves, and therefore, it's resolution limited. So what you see over here is a lesion uh, within a breast of a, of a patient with, um, with breast cancer. And over here, all you see is a lesion, right? You can't really see any details inside the lesion, and therefore, you don't know, for example, if it's benign or malignant. Now, the question is, okay, how could you increase the resolution? So one thing you could think of doing is using contrast agents. And this is a common thing to do. So we know we're probably more familiar with contrast agents in MRI and CT, but you could also use contrast agents in ultrasound. And these are basically micro bubbles that they don't dissolve well um, inside the blood. And therefore, they uh, reflect the ultrasound beam stronger than you get without the bubbles. And um, that could sound like a good thing to do, right? If we get a brighter image, maybe we'll be able to see what we couldn't see before. So this is kind of trying to use the physics in order to improve the imaging. But what happens in this context after you inject these micro bubbles is that it just makes the entire image brighter. Okay, so you're not really getting better resolution, you're just seeing everything brighter, but this doesn't help us uh, separate the lesion from the tissue. In fact, if you ask me, it even makes things worse. Um, it's definitely not giving me more information within the lesion. So physics alone is not solving our problem here. But then the nice thing is that when we combine it with sophisticated mathematical algorithms, which I'll of course describe later on in the talk, and essentially in a nutshell, what these mathematical algorithms are doing are they're tracking these micro bubbles as they flow through the bloodstream. We can see that we could get very good resolution. So this is a super resolved image of the original lesion, where now we can see the, ma the, the microvasculature uh, within the lesion. And from this, for example, unfortunately, in this particular case, we can see that this is a malignant um, tumor. So the physics alone just made everything brighter. But by using the math, we were able to track the micro bubbles. And of course, if we would just try to use the math on the original image, we wouldn't be able to get super resolution because there was nothing to track. So hopefully this gives some intuition of what we mean by combining the physics together with sophisticated mathematical algorithms. Uh, just as another example, before we start going into details, another good example is, is fluorescence microscopy. So you know we, we've mentioned already that standard optical images are resolution limited. And in 2014, the Nobel Prize in, in chemistry went to this really, really clever idea of super resolution fluorescence microscopy. And I'm sure there's people here on this call who could describe this much better than I can. So excuse the very uh, abstract and, and you know I'm not going into details, but just kind of the hand-waving explanation. So basically uh, what, what we do in this method is that we insert fluorophores into the image and we control the, 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 the fluorescence of the fluorophore so that instead of taking one image, we now take a series of thousands of images where in each image only a small number 
of these fluorophores are actually fluorescing. And therefore, since there's a small number of them, we could just localize them. So everywhere we see you know, a, a spot of light, we could just stick a Gaussian. And if we sum over all images, we get this super resolved image. So this works very well. That's why it won the Nobel Prize. It could give an increase in resolution at least tenfold. But the difficulty is that it precludes live cell imaging because now instead of taking one single image, we're taking thousands and in practice often tens of thousands of images, um, which, which of course means that we can't track things uh, that, are, that are changing dynamically. So here we get good spatial resolution, but not good time resolution. And, and again, by, make, by doing a combination of physics and math, so what we do in this case is we increase the fluorescence rate. So we take fewer images where in each one, many fluorophores are fluorescing, but then we use clever algorithms that enable us to localize the fluorophores, even though the density is high. And in that case, we could get also very good spatial resolution and do this with a very, very small number of images, two orders of more magnitude, less images, and, uh, and enable live cell imaging as well. So hopefully I've given you some taste, and of course, we'll go into more detail shortly on, on how we could uh, try and improve technology by looking at new ways of transmitting signals, and then, of course, new ways to acquire them and use uh, sophisticated and modern mathematical tools to extract that information. And this is really the basis for many technologies that we've been looking at in the lab. So some that we'll talk about more today, like super resolution um, and ultrasound, but some other applications that are maybe more engineering based, so I won't go into them here, but but I'll just mention, we've been looking a lot at doing efficient quantization. So being able to represent, let's say communication signals with fewer bits, which could uh, help increase you know, our, our rate when we're doing things over the phone or over the internet. Uh, we could look at applications where we combine uh, functions. So since each one of them we could do efficiently, we could have, let's say from the same sensor, do both sensing, both radar and communication um, and many other technologies that could benefit from this ability to acquire the signals in a more efficient way. So hopefully that gave you a, that gave you a, a taste of what we're working on and what I want to talk about today. And the rest of the talk, I'll, I'll kind of delve into a little bit more detail on, you know, what is this space technology? What, what are the ideas behind it? We'll then focus on specific applications, mainly in ultrasound, a little bit on radar. Then we'll talk about super resolution in both microscopy and ultrasound. And I'll end by showing how these same ideas could be used in modern artificial intelligence or deep learning methods, even though these are purely digital methods, we'll see that the same ideas can enable us to do very efficient AI um, that doesn't need a lot of training data and could incorporate models, which is particularly important in problems that are physics-based where we do know a lot about our problem and want to be able to incorporate it within the deep learning or AI methods. Okay, so let me kind of delve in and start talking a little bit more about the technology. And what you see on the slide here on the top are, are different systems that we developed in the lab based on these technologies. So this is not only theory, but we do also uh, work, work in the lab in order to translate it into concrete devices. So if we look at how you know, acquisition systems are built today, and this is kind of a standard description for most acquisition systems, regardless of what they are, but let's look at this just in the context of ultrasound for an example. So you know, we transmit a signal, we receive a signal back, and when we receive the signal, we're going to go through several operations. So first, we're going to sample it in time, typically based on the Nyquist theorem. We're then going to quantize it, represent it by bits, and then based on the Shannon theorem. And then only after we sampled and quantized are we going to start processing the data, right? We took this data for some purpose for a task. So for example, in ultrasound, we're trying to form an image. So we'll then you know, apply some signal processing algorithm on the data itself. So the disadvantage, though, in this approach, which is totally standard um, in, in almost any engineering device, is that each of these blocks are designed separately. So, you know, none of them know what the other blocks are doing. So, you know, this is based on the Nyquist theorem, irrespective of anything else in the theorem, in, in the system, Shannon, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if you think about it, you know, we may be acquiring many, many physical signals, but at the end, all I want is an image. So an image is really a very low dimensional projection of all the physical signals that I acquired. So somehow, somewhere in the system, we should be knowing that I'm not actually interested in the signals. I'm only interested in some low dimensional representation. But today, that's not taken into account. So what we propose to do instead, which again, I, I think is, is, is kind of obvious, but the question, of course, is how to do that, is first of all, to do joint design. So instead of designing these blocks separately, we design them together. And in this joint design, 
there's three important things that we take into account. So the first is structure. Any structure that we may have in the input or in the system itself or in the output, we take into account in order to simplify each one of these blocks. The other is the task. So you know, if I want an image, I should be operating at a different rate than if I want to actually recover the underlying signals. So the task is very important and we should be taking it into account. And, and finally, we want to remember that we don't actually need to be able to see the output or to hear the output. We could go through some mathematical recovery before we actually hear or see. So I, I, I'll make that clear hopefully in the next few slides. So um, besides using this for acquisition, as I already alluded to, we can also use this to develop very efficient model-based AI methods or, or data-driven methods. And we'll talk about that towards the end of the talk today as well. So let me try to give you know, just simple examples for each one of those elements. So let me start with what we mean by structure. And a good way to understand structure is to look at the radar problem. So in radar, we send a pulse. It hits our target and gets reflected back. And basically what we see, what we receive always is a stream of pulses, each one coming at a different time of arrival, which is you know, proportional to the distance and a different amplitude, which conveys the velocity of the target. Uh, the same model, we actually get an ultrasound. So we send the pulse through the ultrasonic probe and we get reflections as it passes through uh, scatterers in the tissue. And also again, in this case, we're always going to be getting these stream of pulses. So this isn't an arbitrary signal, right? It has structure. It always looks like pulses. And that's not taken into account today in, in sampling and quantization. So if we take that into account, then we can actually develop samplers that operate at a much lower rate, mean much fewer bits, and could get higher resolution. So this is one example of structure that we may have in our signals. Um, another important, important feature that already has to do with mathematical recovery is the issue of dynamic range, which is again something we encounter in any acquisition device. So the dynamic range is defined as the difference between the maximum um, and the, min the minimum values in our signal. And we know that in general, signals beyond the dynamic range are going to be clipped. So these, these are two Im ultrasound images, one with a broad dynamic range and one with a narrow dynamic range. And of course, we could see much better when we have a broad dynamic range, but that is more expensive, right? We don't always have that dynamic range in our device. So of course, we'll see this in any imaging device. So here's another example where we have a high dynamic range image. And again, anything beyond the dynamic range is going to be clipped. So in practice, this is the only thing that we're going to be seeing. So here, what we propose is to rely on this notion of mathematical recovery. So what we do is instead of trying to recover the information, which we can't because we lost it by clipping, we're, we're going to fold it before we sample. So basically, if, for example, our range is going to be between 0 and 10, we're going to take anything out of that range. So if we get you know, the number 12, instead of attempting to represent it by 12, we'll fold it into that range of 0 and 10. So it, the 12 will be represented by 2, and it will kind of overlap anything that was 2 to begin with. OK, so we're folding our data into this regime that we're given. And the advantage of doing that is that we're not losing in any information. So all of the information is there. Of course, the disadvantage is that we get something that looks like a mess, OK? So what you see over here is the original image that's folded. But then after we sample it, we could apply mathematical algorithms in order to recover the original information. So if it's clipped, we just lose the information. But if it's folded, even though it looks like a mess, we could, after mathematical recovery, we could actually see the underlying image. So this is an example of mathematical recovery in the sense that if we just look at this, it doesn't look good. But after we apply the math, we could get the required information. And one of the recent things we've been doing in the lab is actually developing hardware that samples in this way. And in that way, we don't have dynamic range issues. A last feature that I want to talk about, again, in the general framework of PACE technology is the actual hardware. So we can also try to change the information that we're recording. So what do I mean by that? So standard samplers are synchronous, right? They have a clock and they simply look at you know, points of the signal in time. So they're looking at amplitude in points in time. But being synchronous, it has a high price. So it consumes a lot of power. You need a clock. There's different difficulties associated with that. Instead, we could attempt to require what, what we call timing information. So rather than looking at points in time, we could look, for example, at, at points that are event-based. So as one example uh, that we've developed in the lab, we look at the integral of the signal. And every time the integral hits a certain threshold, we record the time at which that happened. OK, so this is timing-based sampling. When the energy of the signal passes a threshold, we record the time and reset. 
And this is the hardware that we developed that, that does it. It's very simple hardware because we don't need a clock. All we need is an integrator and a comparator and a reset mechanism. So this is very easy, consumes uh, minimal power. And, and we could prove mathematically that from these timing events, we have enough information to recover our underlying signal. So just as a quick example, we've been um, applying this, for example, for ECG continuous monitoring. So this is good for cases where power is very important. If you want to continuously monitor a signal, what this allows us to do in special signals that are bursty is that, you know, the integral is not going to pass that threshold so often. So we're not going to have a lot of samples here. The sampling rate is going to be very low. And we can also show that we could represent the samples with very low bits and still get very good recovery. So putting that all together, everything we said until now, these principles enable us to develop acquisition systems that could operate at low sampling rates, at low bit rates, and high dynamic range, and use hardware that is very power efficient. So we've been using these principles for, for many different system designs. Again, here you see some of the boards that we've developed in the lab with some of the applications. And obviously, I've skipped through a lot of the theory and the math. Um, but in our books on the topic, we go into much more detail, both on theory and on the actual hardware implementations. So just on a, on a high level, before we move to applications, just some of the advantages that we could get from this approach is that we could develop you know, more compact and portable devices. Uh, we could do things quicker. So for example, we can use this for fast and quantitative MRI. We could get very efficient wideband sensing, uh, high resolution systems for radar, for communications. We could get joint systems on the same board. Uh, we can get super resolution, which I'll talk more about. And finally, as I said, we can also use these techniques for purely data-driven methods, for AI methods, where we can incorporate these models into the AI methods. Yanina, could so, I just ask sorry. a quick question yes, before yes, you sure. go on? Yeah, so you oh, show very nicely how you have methods to make your signal acquisition more efficient. Do, what influence, if any, does this have on, on the influence of noise in your- Yeah, really, really good question. Okay, so, so really good question. I didn't mention noise uh, up to this point at all, but that's of course a super good question. And part of the reason that we actually build systems and we'll look at applications is to show that it works in practice because there is a gap, right, between the theory and you know what happens with distortions. So, so noise is very important. Um, it has to be taken into account. The, the nice thing is, again, because everything we're doing is, is very principled. So, you know, it's based on properties of the signal that we could, you know, write down mathematically. We could also represent the math in the corresponding bases. So for sure, you know, the noise will affect the systems and it has to be taken into account. But in most of the examples, and that's why these applications work at the end, we could do similar modeling to the noise and then adapt the algorithms that we have for like no denoising, deblurring, interference rejection, et cetera. We could adapt them to this compressed domain. So it has to be taken into account and we could adapt the methods to the compressed domain to also be able to deal with the noise. So hopefully that that addressed your yeah, question. Thank you. Thank you. But but it is a point to take into account. If you ignore the noise, then you will suffer from the noise here because all of these operations are non-conventional. So if you, if you just try to take an off-the-shelf denoising method that people are used to using and apply it to this data, it's it's not going to work. You have to kind of adapt it to the particular operations that we're doing. So, but that is part of the algorithms that we develop. But that's that's a really good point. Okay, so, so at Weizmann, we started the, the Center for Biomedical Engineering. So again, I'll just go through this quickly, um, exactly to address, uh, Sydney, the point that you raised, which is, you know, we want to actually take these ideas and move them to technology, right, to have an actual impact, not, not just to develop um, a new theory, although I appreciate theory as well, of course. Um, so, so within the center, we, we basically have four pillars, of course, the theoretical research, developing bounds, developing the theoretical ideas. The, the lab itself, the sample lab, where we develop the technology, the boards, the hardware devices. We have a clinical arm, and, and I have a clinical manager who's actually a doctor by training, and she manages all of our clinical activities where uh, we try to apply these ideas in different clinical problems. And then a forum that we started recently at Weizmann together with um, um, you know, two other researchers at Weizmann, Avi Levy and Chaim Bentikov, uh, which we call the best forum between science and technology, where our goal there is to try and look more at this interface between you know, technology and different scientific problems. So just you know, going through this quite quickly, so in the technology part of our center, uh, we work a lot with industry to understand kind of what are the unmet needs where research um, could have, have value. And some of the problems that we're working on, I won't go through all of them here in the talk today, but our uh, fast and quantitative MRI, super resolution that we'll talk more about, 
Uh, remote sensing is something we're working on a lot. So using, for example, radar devices to, to sense things remotely, uh, wireless uh, probes, 6G systems, radar communication systems, and high resolution radar systems. Uh, we have the clinical arm where we meet a lot with clinicians to understand unmet clinical needs and how these ideas and different artificial intelligence ideas could have impact in the clinical domain and some of the applications there. Uh, we're working on a super resolution I'll talk more about, a channel data I'll talk more about. Uh, we're looking a lot at how we can use AI to, to make acquisition uh, more efficient, for example, in ultrasound where it's very technology dependent, uh, conversion between modalities. So let's say I have a ultrasound image, but I want it to have quality of a CT image. So trying to convert between these modalities, uh, thanks to COVID, a lot of work on lung ultrasound, combining modalities, so patients And finally, a lot of work on uh, COVID-19 that I'll talk more about towards the end of the talk. Um, so, okay, we have collaborations with different centers. I'll skip that. And uh, let me move on to, to delve into some applications. But before that, let me pause for a minute and see if there's any questions. Okay, so if not, if not I'll, I'll move on to, to talk about some applications. And um, uh, really, Sydney, to your point, uh, you know, there's this famous quote by, by Einstein in theory, theory and practice are the same. In practice, they are not. So one of the things that we try hard in the lab is to try and take the practice into account when we're developing the theory so that the theory will actually work. And hopefully I'll, I'll convince you uh, in the next few slides that we could get these things to work in practice. So let me start with ultrasound. Using these ideas, we've been able to show that we could acquire an ultrasound image using much less data. So we could, we could reduce down to 4% of the rate in each channel and also reduce the number of channels. And this leads to several different advantages. So first of all, it paves the way to 3D imaging. Um, it allows us to do things very quickly so we could get high frame rate, for example, in cardiac imaging. And uh, what to me is one of the most exciting applications is, is a portable device. So in machines today, you know, you have these big machines and you have the probe that's connected with, to, with a cable to the machine itself where this cable is actually analog. So it's actually taking the, the true physical signals and the signal is only sampled and processed within the machine because of the high rates. Now, once we could sample at low rates, we could do it directly within the probe. So we no longer need the cable. Uh, the advantage of course is that we get rid of the machine. So now all we have is a probe and you know, some imaging device where we see the image. The other big advantage is that now we actually have access to what is called the channel data, the data that is coming back from the patient. Here in this machine, the only thing you have access to is the image itself. You don't actually have access to the raw data. So let me quickly show a demo. This is a demo using our probe. Um, this, the cable that you see is just for powering purposing, but the data is going directly from the probe cloud and to a tablet. And this is Dr. Shai Taiman Yoden, a cardiologist that we've been collaborating with from Shiba. Okay, so this subject is my uh, student, my former student, uh, Regev, and here you see that he's scanning directly to the tablet. So as I said, besides just having a compact portable device, we also now get access to the actual raw data. And what we could do now is form an image in a different way that it's formed today. So today the image is formed by a process called beamforming, which is a very standard old um, imaging process. And instead we could take the data and apply you know, more sophisticated AI to it and get much better images with better contrast and better resolution. We can also perform, uh, and this is very new work of, of my student of net, we can also perform what we call inverse ultrasound, which allows us to get quantitative information. So beyond just getting an image, there's more information in the tissue, more physical information like speed of sound, attenuation, density, elasticity. And this could be very informative, for example, to differentiate between a, a, a tissue in a tumor and a regular tissue. So by using the, the physical properties and by having access to the channel data, we could basically invert the wave equations and get these physical parameters. 
Um, another nice application that we could get because we know how to acquire the data more efficiently is wearable ultrasound. So now we can have you know, very simple uh, patches that you could put on the skin. We're of course not developing the patches. We're collaborating uh, with different groups, one at MIT and one of Professor Feng at Tsinghua, where they're of course developing the device. But what we wanna do is take this data, right? Which, is, which has to be very compact because we have to, uh, you know, the data is, is like on some patch and we have to be able to send it over a very narrow wireless um, uh, transmission scheme. But now because we know how to process with a small amount of data, we could get good imaging even from uh, very simple patches. The uh, last application I wanna mention in this context using AI is trying to get, overcome the technician dependence. So trying to aid the technician when they're taking the image again, because we now have access to the actual channel data, um, it is easier to develop AI methods that could guide the technician uh, through, through this process. Um, okay, so those were some applications in the area of ultrasound. Uh, like we already mentioned, ultrasound and radar are, are very, very similar, and therefore things that we could do on ultrasound, we can also do in radar. So I'll just skip through that here. We could get you know, cheap radars with very good resolution. We could get maps quicker, uh, which is, of course, very important, for example, in, in defense applications. Uh, we've been looking a lot at automotive applications for autonomous vehicles where there it's very important to be able to scan the environment very quickly and the ability to do sensing and communication on on the same device uh, we can use the ideas to sparsify arrays so this is good in, in radar and in ultrasound and in any other application where you're using multiple antennas so what we can show is that instead of using the entire antenna we can use only a subset of the elements but still get the same performance. And here, I won't go through the whole movie. All of these movies are on my website, so you could take a look at them. Uh, but this is a recent uh, kind of field experiment that we did at Weizmann, where we looked at just using a subset of the array, but still being able to get very good localization um, of the objects in space. And uh, just a recent demo that we've been working on, like I mentioned before, is joining sensing and communication on the same platform, since we know how to do each one of them in an efficient way. And, and here you see kind of this, this demo where we have these Lego cars that could communicate and sense at the same time. And this is very useful, for example, if you're thinking of autonomous vehicles that have to get a very good picture of the environment, but you know a pedestrian could be in the black zone uh, of, of one of the cars, but if they can also communicate, then they could you know, let everyone in their surroundings know of the different obstacles that they see. Uh, and one last application of radar that I mentioned before as well that we've been working on is, is remote sensing. So the ability, for example, to get vital, sign, vital signs from a distance. Um, this is of course very important in, in pandemics, but also just on, in day-to-day -day routine without having to, to connect patients to a lot of cables, especially for kids, this is very important. And what we could show is that using radar, we could actually in real time get very good extraction for example, of both heart rate and, um, and respiration, which could be very important clinical uh, parameters. All right, so uh, what I wanna do next is move on to talk about uh, super resolution. Um, any questions before I move on? Um, yeah, right. if, if, if oh, you sorry. don't mind going back just to the, uh, to the ultrasound uh, part. So is this, I don't know, a standard ultrasound, you're looking just at say an amplitude or, or a phase or whatever, and you're actually looking at an entire wave shape so you can get out dissipation and other fa is that the general idea or is there something more yeah yeah uh -huh. so there's two aspects so one is that we could do it very efficiently and therefore you know just on the device level i don't have to have a big machine i could just have um you know a simple probe but the other advantage that that gives me is because i could do it efficiently i could actually get the data itself not just the image today all you get is the image because everything else is just too heavy to output so it's, it's processed within the machine and you don't have access to it. So because we know how to do more efficient acquisition, I can actually output the actual raw data. And then once I have the raw data, I can apply various sophisticated algorithms to it. For example, algorithms based on the wave equations in order to extract the underlying physical parameters. So it's, uh, I, it's enabled, can I, sorry. Can I add to this question, Eli? It would, specifically for the uh, elect, uh, elasticity, it's simply the uh, uh, low frequencies that you look at, or where is the information? Right. In? Okay, so we can have a whole discussion on that. Let me answer quickly, but then I'm happy to take it up more in the question part. So, in in general, there's various ways in which you could get elasticity by changing, like you're saying, by by changing the signaling, the waveform, the frequency. Um, mm -hmm. That's one way of doing it on a conventional machine from the image domain. 
What, what we're saying is that even without changing anything, if you have access to the actual raw data, you could get all of these parameters from just solving an inverse uh, wave equation without having to change externally all of the parameters. Because I'm no longer dependent on the image, I could, I could solve the wave equations. Okay. So, and I'm, 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 I'm definitely happy to talk more about that um, at the end, but hopefully I hope that gave you kind of a first level answer. Yeah, thank you, thank you, fine. Problem much better than I do. Uh, together with the with the solution, uh, you know, from from um, um, the the Nobel Prize in two thousand and fourteen for the super resolution uh, fluorescence microscopy, and um, in the standard approach, like I already explained, what basically what you do is you localize you know, those blinking points. And what we've done in earlier group, in earlier work with the group of uh, Professor Montiseca from the Technion is first before doing learning, we just apply uh, structure-based algorithms that exploit the structure and can do this for much fewer images. So uh, the method was called uh, SPARCOM. And here you see results of SPARCOM from two orders of magnitude less data compared with what you get with STORM, the method behind the Nobel Prize. And once we know how to exploit sparsity, we can also exploit it in a learned fashion and get even better um, super resolution. So I'll talk more about the learned results uh, at the end. And uh, very recently, we've been working with uh, Professor Villardaran and his group to see if we could actually use this in real time for live cell imaging. And this is very much uh, work in prog pro progress, but these are some of the initial results where we're able to show that we could, we could track or at least you know, get better tracking of cellular dynamics uh, particularly here, we're looking at T cell activation by using these techniques. Okay, so that was all microscopy, but an interesting question is, you know, could we do the same thing in other modalities like ultrasound? And like I mentioned already before, what we could do to kind of replace the fluorophores is using these contrast agents. So this is very similar in concept to microscopy. Uh, in order to show these ideas, we work together with, um, with Dr. Hoover Grubstein from Bellington Hospital, uh, who, who is the head of the radiology unit over there. And we scanned you know, patients with, with um, uh, unfortunately with breast cancer to see if we can improve the resolution. So let me show you here some of these results. So this was one of the patients. This is what you see in a standard ultrasound. And after you use our super resolution methods, you can see much more detail. And what you see in this case is that it's an oval mass that has homogeneous blood flow throughout the mass. And therefore clinically, this is a fibro denoma, which is a benign breast tumor. This is another image, which again, they all look the same, right? They all just look like black holes. But in this case, after you apply the algorithm, um, what you're gonna see after super resolution is this round structure that has blood flow only on the walls. And therefore this is indicative of a cyst. And finally, the last tumor, which again, just looks like a black hole, but after you apply our um, algorithms, what you see is an irregular mass that has you know, these very ill-defined uh, margins with you know, high concentration of blood vessels here at the periphery. And therefore this is indicative of a malignant tumor. So here you see all of these three tumors together. In standard ultrasound, they look very similar, but after super resolution, we could clearly see the difference between that. All right, so let me end. I think I have about five minutes and then I'm really happy to go back to the questions asked before. So let me end very quickly by talking a little bit about how we can apply these ideas also to data-driven methods and to modern AI techniques. So, you know, as everyone I think knows today, AI is, is everywhere, right? We get really, really good uh, performance using deep learning methods in many different applications, computer vision, speech processing, um, and many, many more, but mainly in problems that were really difficult to tackle before using conventional optimization methods. So we know that we could get you know, really good empirical success better than every, anything we've seen before. Uh, it, it, it's well known that with AI, we could get you know, uh, classification rates that you know, far surpass anything a human can do. We could do crazy things that I don't know if a human wants to do, but people write a lot of papers about these things. So we could spawn fake faces, right? All of these faces are fake. There are no such real people. Um, again, you know, that, I don't know how, if, how and if that benefits science, but it is something you could do with um, deep learning. Uh, but of course, all of this comes with a cost. So we need to have you know, really large training sets to get these good results. The, the training can be computationally super exhaustive. It's not clear how well we can interpret our results. Typically we can't, so it's just a black box and we kind of have to trust the output. It's not clear how well it 
it generalizes once the data is a little bit different from what we train on, and the complexity could be huge. So one example of a modern AI method that's used for text translation is GPT-3, and it relies on 175 billion parameters, okay? So, you know, that's a huge amount of parameters, and obviously you're going to need tons of data in order to train that, and it's not clear how well you could trust the result that's relying on so many trained parameters. Now, if we look at, you know, signal processing, physics-based processing, et cetera, traditionally, this is all based on modeling. We know, you know, how to incorporate what we know, how to incorporate structure into the problem. We could get inference from small amounts of data, and typically we have analytical techniques to assess the quality of the output, so we know how well we're doing. The difficulty, though, that, of course, this relies on very accurate model knowledge, and the inference could be rather slow. So what we've been working on a lot in our lab in recent years is how to combine the two, is trying to combine techniques of model-based methods with deep learning. So in order to kind of understand intuitively how we do that, let me give a very uh, bird's eye view of model-based processing versus deep learning, and then we'll see kind of how we can merge them. So in model-based processing, typically you're given a measurement, let's call it Y, it's your data. Okay, maybe it's a noisy image. There's something you want to extract, let's call it X, maybe it's the clean image. And in between, you have some known relationship or assumed relationship between Y and X. So you're going to assume that Y is approximately G of X. And then what you do is you define some metric, maybe some error, some squared error. And you're going to try to design an algorithm that optimizes that metric. So typically, you'll have an iterative algorithm, right? Typically, this won't have a closed form solution. And your iterative algorithm will look like something like this. You'll have some pre-processing. Then you'll have these iterations where the iterations you could break down to a block that, that is just a generic computation and then a block that depends on model parameters. And then you'll typically have some post-processing and you get your desired output. Now, if you look at deep learning, then of course the situation is very, very different. We have many paired inputs and outputs. We use that to train a fixed network. So this network is fixed in advance. The architecture is fixed. It has nothing to do with your particular problem, but we use the data to train the weights. And then when a new input comes in, we hope that miraculously we'll get a good estimate of the output. So how could we combine these two? They're obviously very different. So we do that in two ways. One is in a method called deep unfolding, where basically we take our iterative algorithm and we use that to inspire an architecture of a deep network. And the other is a more plug-in approach where we take our algorithm and any time that we just see something that depends on the model, instead of the model, we plug in a very simple shallow network just for that block. So not for end-to-end -end learning, but just for that particular block. So let me just quickly show the ideas and, and with that we'll end. So in deep unfolding, an idea going back to a beautiful paper of Gregor and Lacoon from 2010, but recently has been gaining a lot of interest. So in unfolding, we take our iterative algorithm, we write down a finite number of steps of the algorithm. And then within these steps, we free the parameters that we don't know. So anything that is model-based that we don't know, we just learn from training data. So this gives us an uh, architecture that is based on our iterative algorithm, but is still learned from data. And we recently wrote a review on this topic. So anybody who's interested in more details could take a look at our review. So we've been using this in many, many applications. In the interest of time, I'll just quickly show the results. So we've used this, for example, for MLD, uh, image denoising, where we developed an iterative algorithm in the gradient domain. And what's nice is that it's this is a very simple network. It follows from the optimization uh, problem. It has 10 layers, you know, something very, very simple, but it still leads to better results than uh, all of the state of the art methods there that are much more complicated networks and that were trained on much larger, larger databases. Um, we can also learn the regularizer. So if we don't know the regularizer, we could also learn the regularizer from the data in the same way. And this actually allows us to solve much more difficult problems, like, for example, um, inputs where a whole area is just gone or, or corrupted images with a lot of noise. And these are problems that are really hard to do with just optimization. But when we use the optimization to inspire a network, then we get uh, very good recovery results. Uh, we've been using this for COVID detection. So this is um, within our clinical arm. This is a project that we started when COVID began with uh, four different hospitals in Israel. And the first task was to see if we could get good COVID detection results from x-ray. And we were able to get, again, using these model-based ideas, uh, over 90% uh, detection rate. And just to show you that it's not trivial. So again, in the interest of time, uh, we won't play the game of everybody kind of guessing what's COVID and what's not. But you could take a quick look at these images and then at the results. So some of these are not obvious, right? This one is positive to COVID, although the lungs look pretty clean. Um, you know, Some of these are, are negative, although the lungs look 
um, actually pretty, pretty dirty. So it's not always a simple problem, but using these algorithms, we could get very good results, even though we didn't have uh, a large training set. And obviously the training set here is, is very diverse. Uh, we've been using this also for COVID detection from ultrasound. Uh, we could use this for signal separation. So for example, in ultrasound, one of the problems is separating the blood flow that you see over here from the tissue background, which gives us a lot of clutter. And here we did that by modeling the background as low rank and modeling the tissue as sparse. And then again, using this unfolding idea. And this allows us to separate the two really, really nicely. So this is the original image. And here you see the signal separation. And again, we do this from very small training data, uh, but still get uh, very good results. The, the second approach that I said is good for problems when we don't have an optimization formulation. We just have you know, an algorithm that we're used to using, but maybe some of it depends on parameters we don't know. And then what we do is we just take the block that depends on the model and we replace that by a shallow network. And uh, this we've been using particularly in communication problems where there's very good algorithms you know, that are implemented in our phones. So we don't wanna replace them, but we do wanna make them more um, adaptive by being able to learn locally without a lot of training data and we've been using these approaches uh, in many different communication problems. So with that, let me end. So there's still some time for questions. So we've seen that if we want to get efficient, uh, interpretable, and uh, uh, high resolution methods, we, we could couple physics and algorithms to be able to learn more from less data. Uh, we've talked a little bit about new mathematical limits and physical limits, super resolution limits that this could lead to, um, a little bit about engineering devices that can implement these ideas. And you know, to me, one of the more exciting things is to think about how we could take this to kind of you know, develop different scientific and clinical breakthroughs now that we could see things that we couldn't do before. And this is, of course, not work that I can do. So this is work uh, that I'd, I'd really be happy to collaborate with you know, any of you interested on this call to see how we can use these techniques on this interface uh, with clinical and scientific algorithms. So I've skipped through, of course, all of the technical details so you can find them in our, in our books and in our papers on my webpage. Um, none of this would have been possible without my really amazing, amazing group of, of students and lab staff, so I'd like to thank them. And of course, all of my amazing collaborators who have, uh, you know, without them, none of this work would have been done. So I wanna thank all of them. And thank you very much for your attention. I hope at least some of this was relevant to some of what you do. And I'd be super, super happy both to take questions and also offline if relevant to discuss any uh, potential application areas. So thank you very much. Thank you. Well, really, really amazing. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, so I, I, if I just take my privilege of starting out with just a couple of questions, one probably quick and the other one maybe more involved. Um, the, the first one is, um, is there any chance that your ability to look at, uh, at these lesions and tumors uh, will at some point replace the need for doing a biopsy on, on uh, people who have exhibit these kinds of growth? And yeah, the that's a really, one, really good, that's a really good question. And, you know, we, we'd love if the answer would be yes. So it's definitely a holy grail. Um, you know, that's definitely one thing that we're working on. So the, you know, we, if we could, if we could prove, you know, right now, this is a small study, right? Right now we did this on 20 patients in, in a particular setting. Obviously to reach the point that it replaces biopsy, we have to do something much more large scale. Um, and, and we're definitely working on that right now. So I, I hope that I could say yes, but, you know, I can't draw that conclusion from the small study that we did. But, you know, that's, that's definitely, uh, you know, one of the aims, um, a maybe less ambitious aim that we're also thinking of as kind of like a first step is one of the things that, again, this is just input we're getting from the clinicians, of course. So one of the things they said is that even when they do biopsies, um, you know, uh, the, the best is to do biopsy under MRI, but that is very difficult to do. And when they do biopsy under ultrasound, the resolution is not always good enough. So one of the things that we were thinking, ultimately, we'd like to replace biopsies, but as, as a step towards there, we're looking at, you know, could we use this even to do guided biopsies, but, but to have less, you know, for the for the biopsy to be more efficient, to take the right tissue, not to have to repeat it, not to have to take so much tissue, um, even using ultrasound during the biopsy as, as a first step. Uh, so that's that's kind of one of the things we're looking at now, but definitely aiming ultimately to replace biopsy if, if we could get that far. Okay, we hope you succeed. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> um, and then I had a second question is, the way you started and the way you ended. So, um, Deep learning is also very good at optimization, and I'm wondering if you've thought of or you try to apply deep learning to develop your acquisition uh, models. 
Yeah, yeah, another really good question. We are working on that. We call that learning to sample. Um, I just didn't have time to, you know, I, as it is, I think I probably covered too many topics, but yeah, so that's one of the things we're looking at today. And uh, we actually just submitted a paper on that called learning to sample, where we're basically using these ideas to learn, you know, what are the best samples to take, right? Because I mean, we, today, we're, the choice of samples is based on, on various different metrics, but but you know that's they're not necessarily optimal, and they're definitely not data driven. So uh, we, we are looking at at problems where we kind of have this feedback, right? As we're taking the data, could we use the data we've already taken in order to guide what are the best next points to sample? So definitely, that's something that we we started working on right now. I would say the first paper that we submitted is probably more theoretical. Uh, we're, we're definitely happy to look at applications. So if if you have a concrete application in mind, I'd be super happy to talk about it, and we could at least start from what we've already developed and see how good that holds up in real applications, and then if needed, of course, adapt it to, to better fit the application. Uh, the floor is open. Any other questions? You hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks for the fascinating uh, talk. Thank I you. I don't see in your uh, presentation any uh, deal with the acquisition or build a 3D imaging. Uh, okay, another really, really good question. So, so yeah, okay, so let me, let me try to answer that in parts. So some of the um, techniques that we've looked at are, are the same in 3D and 2D. It's just that uh, it's harder to show 3D. I don't know, it's just easier. Like, for example, we have applied this to different problems in 3D ultrasound. Um, it's just a little bit harder to visualize. So, um, you know, I just showed the images in 2D. So some of the things apply equally well to 3D. Um, some of them don't. Some of them have real challenges in 3D. So, for example, you know, to totally share where we are. So if we look at the microscopy problem, um, you know, the 2D problem is, is easier. In the 3D problem, we have the issue that the PSF is changing, uh, you know, as we go through the Z location. And that makes the 3D problem actually fundamentally different than the 2D problem. Um, and that's something that's ongoing work. So I actually have a new postdoc who's working specifically on the 3D problem. So in, in some of the cases, it, it's the same. I just showed 2D because it's easier for me on the screen. Um, but in some of the applications, there are challenges that are directly coming from the 3D. Microscopy is one of them. And I, I would say that conceptually, the same techniques apply, uh, but, but it is more challenging and, and it's definitely something that is ongoing work. So it's a really, really good point. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? If there's no questions, let me say again, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate yeah. the, I really appreciate the questions. And uh, and again, I think you know people here are all working on fascinating things that are probably different than what we're doing. So I'm I'm really happy offline. If anybody finds anything interesting, I'm I'm really happy to discuss offline as well. Right. So we'd like to thank you again. This has really been eye-opening and fascinating and uh, certainly enjoyable. And uh, thank everybody uh, for listening and have a good afternoon. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.